a lot of people really aren't aware that islands represent some of the greatest concentrations of all these different types of plants and animals, but they're also where the most species extinctions have occurred. Up to 75% of all the extinctions that have happened, those things are happening on islands. We've lost reptiles and mammals and birds, and you know these great species are never going to come back again. Penny Becker, the VP of Conservation, joins the podcast to detail how island conservation prevents the extinction of endangered wildlife by removing the invasive species that are causing the potential extinction. This is a great inside look into examining the many different direct and indirect causes of a species becoming endangered. So. Let's do it. Too many days in the darkness Without a glimpse of the light Running tired and broken and scared But I swear I'll never give up the fight I see you broken and beat Head pulled down over your eyes Every part of you wants to surrender Penny, thanks for uh, joining me today. My pleasure. So I absolutely love what you guys do. And I feel like in today's world, like every person should have a true basic understanding, sort of like what math and science is of like what conservation truly is and just how much effort and care goes into it. If you wouldn't mind kind of getting us started by giving some quick insight into really what island conservation is and the the problems that you guys are you know out there to solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I agree with you. I think everyone should really know what is out there and being done in conservation. And I think more often than not, when people think about the environment and about conservation, they think about the problems and they get really mired in all of these negative things going on. And oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Climate change, mass extinction of biodiversity, like all these things are happening, but I think that's where I was really excited a few years ago when I found island conservation, because it really is like this giant story of hope that there is something we can do about it, right? It's not that we just have to sit back and watch all of these things happen. And island conservation, our mission is in particular focused on islands, on preventing extinction of wildlife species, wildlife and plant species, by removing invasive species. And a lot of people really aren't aware that islands represent some of the greatest concentrations of all these different types of plants and animals, but they're also where the most species extinctions have occurred. Up to 75% of all the extinctions that have happened, all the things, the stories that you might have heard in the media, those things are happening on islands. We've lost reptiles and mammals and birds and you know these great species are never going to come back again and you know the reports are that more and more of these species are you know, at threat of extinction and that's really what we're working to fight against there's a lot that can be done on this front in particular around invasive species we have a problem like on islands we have special species that have developed there and what that means is that they only know the threats that are on those islands for many, many, many generations, right? So when we bring something novel to those islands, different predators and different competition, for example, around invasive species, those species really struggle and often it leads to their extinction. So if we can counteract yeah. all of this that we've done over time with humans bringing these invasive species to these islands, then we can really reverse the entire negative effects that are happening on on those islands. So we work with these communities, with local governments, and with our partners all around the world to prevent extinctions and to rewild these islands and bring back the native plants and animals that should be there. Yeah, that that blew me away, that stat. Um, the 75% the of reptile, bird, amphibians, and mammal extinctions combined occurred on islands. Because I think 
we're just so geared to think about endangered species. We think about the rhinos and elephants in Africa or the, you know, cute little pandas in Asia. Um, but islands just are, are the majority of those extinctions. And we kind of underestimate how complex the the those factors are because in in places like Africa and so it's it's usually pretty easy to determine the the problem where it's like okay poaching and, and habitat destruction is what's causing the extinction of rhinos mm -hmm. or in certain rhinos and elephants and would you be able to um kind of define like what what do you mean when you when you refer to a species as being um invasive mm -hmm. yeah so these are species that have not evolved for these particular habitats and, and geographies and they're things that have been brought to these islands um, by humans most of the time, and that um, they have a damaging impact on the in the environment, the habitats there, and on the the native species that are have evolved in these places. So um, surprisingly enough, people don't often think about this, but in almost eighty five, like eighty to eighty five percent of all the islands in the world, and there's like four hundred sixty five thousand islands all over the world. I saw that. 465,000. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. And I looked at the map that's behind me and I was like, yeah. I'm definitely missing a lot. You're of missing a lot of this. islands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Pacific Ocean alone should have a lot of dots on that that are, are currently missing. But yes. think about those 465,000 islands and about 80% of those have invasive rodents. So mm. since the time, you know, long, long ago, uh, Native peoples moving them around all the way to think of the damage that pirates and traders and you know, everything else did over time. And then we today are continually bringing species from here to there. It could be rats, it could be mice. Um, these days, a lot of ants are being moved from place to place. We have um, feral animals like goats, um, cause a lot of damage in places that they don't belong. For example, goats, pigs, cows, even cats in some cases, mm. right? You bring cats to a place like um, some of these islands have generations of seabirds that thrive in these places. And then you introduce cats as an, a novel predator to these places. And in some places like New Zealand, it's documented that they've just decimated entire populations and had species go extinct because of the predation of um, novel invasive species like that. Yeah, I've read in the the European settlers in the 19th century did not do the um, species any justice by bringing along those rats and mosquitoes and, and so forth. And I thought it was very ironic. Charles Darwin's trip over to brought rats. And I just thought it was so ironic that Darwin bringing invasive species, which then eventually killed off i mean not, obviously not intentionally um but it ended up uh you know causing a lot of major problems um especially it, i was reading about a i don't know if you've ever heard of an eev bird in hawaii um where they're getting threatened by mosquitoes now because they live these eev birds live over four thousand feet in elevation so they're pretty safe but with rising temperatures it's causing mosquitoes to travel up to go into higher elevation yeah and, and they carry the malaria with them. yeah exactly how do you guys really find that problem to where it's just you know you have less eev e e birds excuse me and then all of a sudden how do you find that there's an invasive species as small as the mosquito so hard to track mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, thankfully, there's been a lot of study on islands. We have that in our back pocket, right? We can thank you guys for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, so we know a lot of things about islands and how things used to be and what the impacts of a lot of these invasive species are, right? And some of them are really direct, like a disease from an invasive species. Uh, like, for example, uh, feral cats can bring some diseases like toxoplasmosis that can affect even marine mammals on the coast, right? So you have endangered like monk seals in Hawaii being affected by cats and and when what they bring. Oh, wow. There's a lot of studies throughout that have the that are documenting direct impacts as well as indirect impacts. So an invasive species, let's continue to use rodents because we've been talking about them. They go to a place and there's native forest on this beautiful uh, island in the Pacific, say but they can completely change the whole composition of the forest 
by eating the seedlings and the uh, small propagules of the forest before they can actually mature. And they can select for different types of trees and plants that they like versus others. So they're completely changing how the forest grows over time, which then, of course, affects all the species that would have otherwise used this habitat. Either it's not, it doesn't have the food sources for these species anymore. It doesn't have the habitat for them anymore. And so you can have a lot of direct impacts as well. One of the major things that we've been focusing on at Island Conservation um, right now is those indirect effects go beyond what you just see on land on an island, but the invasive species and when you're able to remove them from the ecosystem, it shows how linked what you do on land is connected to what's happening in the ocean. So we've just started this oh, wow. initiative with some of our partners called the Island Ocean Connection Challenge. And the goal is to restore 40 island ocean ecosystems by 2030. And that's because both our local indigenous island people have known for generations that land and sea are connected. And they used to manage this way, right? And think about it in that way. It's a really Western idea for us to separate, oh, we do this with ocean and we do this with land and we do these things separate. And, um, and recent research shows that when you take away something like an invasive species, take away that threat and the ecosystem starts to bring itself back, the flow of nutrients changes, right? So imagine you've got fish all the way out in deep sea that something like an albatross is eating and bringing back to its island where it's nesting. And it's depositing those nutrients in the form usually of guano, a bird poop, onto the island. Mm. And then that goes into the soil, into the plants, and into the nearshore environment. And then it's feeding things like the coral reefs that are offshore. When you have seabirds in these places, for example, that are next to coral reefs, they are able to make the coral more resistant to climate change. They're able to make the coral grow faster, and it's able to make it healthier and produce more fish on these coral reefs. And that only happens when you don't have invasive species like rats. So these studies are showing places you have rats, you don't have thriving coral reefs. They're really struggling places you remove them, you remove the invasive species, you have these much more thriving, much more climate resilient places. So our goal is to try to restore these ecosystems, get them back to where they need to be, because you have this full effect all the way from land to sea of how it can benefit. Yeah, that that kind of brought up a thought in my mind, it kind of works the same way as like how we get our food and like when there's E. coli outbreaks, you know, it's like where there's just a chain reaction that goes all the way through the supply chain and then affects the final person who's who's eating it. And rats being the main, is it safe to say they're the main invasive species? Uh, if you were to kind of. They're the most widespread, but certainly yeah. there are lots of different invasives all around the world. Yep. Because I, I feel like we typically don't think of them as like a, a true predator because they're so like small, but yet they cause such widespread destruction. So so quickly to where those animals um are just can't adapt um as quickly to these 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 rapid uh rapid changes how do you guys typically um become aware of like a a rapid decline in a species because of an invasive species on an island mm -hmm. yeah so uh one of the things that is really front and center, so you just mentioned it's people don't think of things like rats and mice as predators, but on a few islands, and uh, one example I can think of is Midway Island, which is in the Pacific. It's part of one of the U.S. and the Hawaiian Island chain, right? Mm -hmm. And it's got all this beautiful um, animals on it now. It was huge in World War II. It's got all this relics on it. It's an amazing place I got to visit a few years ago. But they have a seabird population that has been monitored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because it's a fish and wildlife refuge. So what they noticed several years ago is that, yeah, they knew they had invasive mice on the island, but the mice are actually attacking these albatross. Mm. Imagine, so these albatross have like seven foot wingspans. They are beautiful birds that spend years out at sea and then after seven or eight years they can only start breeding super long-lived bird they only have one chick a year so 
it's really important that they survive. Yeah. You have these birds after that long come back to breed on this island where they were where they were hatched. And these mice are actually even eating the adults while they're sitting on their nest trying to incubate their eggs. And it's so important they keep that egg warm. They really don't want to move. And some of them are being killed by these invasive mice, not to mention the mice eating the eggs and eating the chicks and preventing all that reproduction. So some of that effect of these invasive species is right in front of people's faces and they're starting to document it. And then other things like what we've talked about is more subtle and you have to do a lot more um, research to really understand the full impacts, right? Yeah, that seems very aggressive because I was always thinking that um, they, you know, the egg predation, they're going after the hatchlings or so and uh, being the the main focus. But I mean, if they're even attacking the uh, the the mama there too, that's, yeah. I mean. There's the... cameras that have been set up to watch, uh, you know, nesting sea turtles on the beaches, right? Like such a cool thing to see the the hatchlings come out and make their way to the ocean. But then, you know, we're accidentally catching rats. Mm. going and eating the hatchlings or feral pigs going and eating the hatchlings as they're just trying to make it to the ocean right and yeah. and swim away like i've crazy. seen those i've seen those videos and if you see those turtles like hatch and then try to make their way to sea it is the most anxiety ridden yes. thing you can ever see because yeah. oh and birds and birds i've seen the birds swoop down and, and grab them too i mean talk about just a a one mile it's stretch yeah, uh -huh. the gauntlet. That's a good <laughs> way to put it. Oh my gosh. And I don't even think they, they don't even know what, what they're actually doing either. They don't yeah. know how much danger they're, they truly are in. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. yep. Would you be able to give us like uh, an example of maybe like an island in, in particular where you, um you, you guys had identified a problem. You had to come up with like a, um a solution, implement it, and then always try to research back and see kind of where um where your, where your progress was going sure yeah there's there's certainly lots of examples that could give you one that stands out as one of the most dramatic and i think exciting things that we've been able to see as a success is on pinzon island in the galapagos and so mm -hmm. on pinzon they have the pinzon uh, giant tortoise and the giant tortoise for about 150 years has um, struggled to have any new hatchlings actually hatch in the wild because they've had invasive <laughs> invasive animals on the island. So who knows? Maybe Darwin helped in that um, particular yeah, instance. Yeah, he might, he might have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in that particular instance. But so you've got these um, what was happening is because no new hatchlings were able to survive, you had this aging population of tortoises that were about ready to blink out. Mm -hmm. So since the like the mid uh, 1960s, they realized this was happening and they were trying to bring some of the eggs into captivity and try to get them so they were big enough so maybe they wouldn't be impacted as much by the invasive species. And that worked a little bit, but still you had this population that was ready to blink out. They're all just getting older and older and older. Oh, man. So, um, so we worked with the, the national park there, Galapagos National Park, and several other partners in removing the invasive species from the island, including the, the rodents there. And, you know, I think it was just about a year afterwards, we have um, our staff, and I remember we have a video of it, Paula Castaño is going back to the island to uh, document the change over time. And she was able to witness for the first time in like 150 years, the very first hatchlings. Oh, that's awesome. Out of their nest of these tortoises. And, um, and now today you've got several ages of tortoises that are surviving. They've been downlisted um, so that they're not as threatened as they used to yeah. be. And the population's really, you know, doing great. So exciting stuff. That is, you guys are changing history on these islands, especially the sea turtle. That is such a beautiful creature. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I, and I thought a lot of people have heard about the Galapagos in particular, right? And the the wonderful species that are only found there and how evolution has changed things over time, thanks to the stories Darwin told. That sort of thing's playing out all across the world on islands and yeah. these special species. And it's just, it's so amazing that we get to help save them.
And the Galapagos Islands, is is that the story that um Leonardo DiCaprio um kind of like chimed in on or so? Because I remember l- looking at your guy's Twitter and so and Instagram and I he like he like chimed in or there's something. Can you tell can you tell yeah. us about that? Yeah, well, so um Yes, I think he definitely did talk about some of the effects that we've been seeing. We just did a a 10-year post-recovery for Pinzone and Rabida Island in in the Galapagos, and we're able to document species that have never been found there before, species that were only found in fossil records, like a a gecko. Yeah. And, um, and, And so, yes, really exciting stuff we put out there, and we talked about how Floriana Island, which is also in the Galapagos, is part of our portfolio of the Island Ocean Connection Challenge. And Leonardo DiCaprio is a big supporter of the Island Ocean Connection Challenge, and and, um, his organization, Rewild, is a partner of ours on that. So he chimed in to say, like, how amazing to document (laughs) impacts over time, right? And so it's always great to get a little help from, from some famous people. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's uh, that's that's awesome stuff. You got Leo on your side. I mean, that's a good backing there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> certainly doesn't hurt. <laughs> and how is the uh, how is the tracking like on um? How does some of the tracking work when you're you're trying to determine certain numbers? You guys have like uh like special equipment. Um, I mean, I'm I'm sure you you guys can't be going in there and counting them one by one and putting like a, a red piece of tape on these turtles or something, right? <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Definitely not. Thank thank goodness we have some modern technology that's that's helping us do things in a lot of different ways now. Like we actually at Island Conservation, we have a whole innovation program where we're focused on how do we find new solutions to do these things with Mm. less manpower, more efficient, less cost, right? So we can do more. And so there's several things that we're working on on that front with monitoring things. Uh, One in particular I can think of is environmental DNA. So you can actually take a water sample or a soil sample and be able to filter it through collect the DNA of lots of different species that might be there. So you could detect the absence or the presence of uh, an invasive species there, or you could detect the absence or the presence of an endangered species that you're trying to see is is in a certain place. Another um, really important one for tracking progress that we're working on uh, with partners is using drones. So we can cap it, capture imagery over time. Like how's the vegetation changing? We could even count, the seabirds as they're nesting from above and be able to to look at that growth over time things like that so yeah thankfully we have lots of um really fun tools in our in our pocket that we're we're using and developing all the time oh that's awesome stuff that's awesome yeah. stuff you can actually get in there and not actually have to like put yourselves at risk even though i'm sure you guys have have been at risk i'm sure with the the climate out there and just being on an island you ever never been in before i'm i'm like almost allergic to everything under the sun so if i were to step in on those islands you'd i'd have to go in with like a hazmat suit (laughs) well you're welcome anytime but we'll come fully prepared with everything we'll need but yeah our staff is amazing they are so dedicated and willing to step into uh, sometimes really the unknown and in some places really remote areas um it's something that we takes very calculated risks on and we come very prepared for and um you know so far we've been very lucky in keeping everyone safe and sound and and um and and helping local communities and and wildlife there so yeah i was gonna ask too what is it like have have you guys ever ran into any um indigenous people on on these islands and you said you you were either partners or with the local community you always have to work with what are some of those interactions um kind of like Mm -hmm. sure yeah so all of our projects that we work on you know island conservation does not own any land none of these islands belong to us they belong to others right so it's really their project and we're assisting them in what it is that they want to accomplish in these places right and so um, certainly that includes the local communities and the indigenous peoples that that live there So a variety of different situations across the world, but really we're waiting for them or offering to them what it is we can help them with. And then, and then, and we go from there. So a few different examples that we have from all over the world. One uh, we're assisting right now in Palau in the Pacific ocean. Um, 
there's an island, uh, well, a group of four islands called Sansaral State, one of the states within Palau, and they have a very small community that lives there. And it is very far away from the main island of Palau, like a full day boat ride just to mm. get there. They're very isolated from the rest of the community. They get um, supplies and provisioning only about quarterly. They get a boat that comes out there to help them. And they've always relied on subsistence farming, on producing their own goods. And in particular for the economy, they've uh, they've produced coconut syrup. It's a preservative mm. and a sweetener and it acts like a, a few different things. But with the um, further growth of the rat population there and the coconut rhinoceros beetle, an insect that really attacks the coconut trees, they're really struggling with that. So they've asked us to help to try to uh, eliminate those effects, bring back the coconut industry, and to protect their native animals that they utilize for natural resource purposes and for subsistence. So that's our, our goal. We're working on fundraising for that project um, to start in 2024. And, um, and so that's a great example of where they're in the lead. They're the ones that are going to set up their own what we call biosecurity, which is how do you make sure that invasives don't come back to the island once we remove them, right? And make sure that it's it's um it's bulletproof after that. And um and you know they're working hand in hand with us as we as we do this work. Have you ever you know gotten rid of an invasive species um and, and thought that that was pretty much the cause and then you didn't see the expected increase in a in um a species numbers that you expected and then it turned out that there was something different or supplemental also affecting them have you have you ever found that you know i i think as you say that the thing that comes to mind is you know we talked about before how there's all these indirect impacts of invasive yes, species yeah. and sometimes it's really hard to know exactly what that's going to look like once you remove the invasive species what that's going to come come out to right so Palmyra Island is a really good example. It's been about 10 years since um, the work has been done there. What happened is you remove all those invasive species. And um, what we found is in some places you had a lot of the native forests come back. But in a lot of yeah. other places, you had coconuts start flourishing, right? And coconuts were, are not native to Palmyra Island. And they were taking over in some places. Well, the native animals can't use coconuts for, for the large part, right? These seabirds, they want to nest in native trees. Yeah. So we look at this, we got, now we got another issue that we have to deal with, right? So we're working with our partners there on Palmyra to remove the coconuts and help to restore the native forests in those places so that, you know, because of this um, uh, unintentional uh, release of the coconut population. Yeah, there's so many indirect variables. It really, um, I, it's got to make your, uh, you know, the, your your job the toughest. I would assume because you, if it's not just one straight cause, you know, like the direct uh, with the poaching with the rhinos, kind of like you know, I was chatting about with the EEV birds where it was with mosquitoes, but th those birds are actually too being affected by um, their habitat destruction because the trees also have a pathogen that's killing them off. So th those birds are also being affected by two different things. That's so it's just cool. the, yeah. in I guess I'm just, I'm in so impressed by the in-depthness of everything because those indirect elements are so gotta be so hard to find. You guys must have like the best scientists like in the world and the, and the, and the best, <laughs> the best people in the world working. Cause it's so to determine those things. Part of my uh, new show next week, a little sneak peek I'm doing, I'm chatting about the salmon out in California being, um, affected by their own diet so it's actually them who is a um like their own enemy where it's the um the winter run tunic salmon are out in california and they're actually their numbers have hit the worst they've ever been in 2022 and the reason was obviously habitat destruction with dams and you know droughts and extreme heats but scientists realized what the real indirect threat was which was that salmon have changed their diet to start chomping on anchovies and anchovies have a what's called thiamine, which is it, it, if you eat too much of it, it makes you vitamin deficient. So all these salmon are ignoring their normal diet and just 
eating everything that's the, these anchovies. And then their hatchlings are also born vitamin deficient and now they can't swim. So not only is the habitat destruction, but now it's, you know, put this on top of it. And in 2022, yeah. it's the worst numbers that they've seen ever. And well, um, very and impressive. I think that's the, I mean, we've certainly learned a lot about islands, but it would be uh, totally unrealistic to say we know everything about the natural world, right? That's one of the reasons why I love science and I, I love nature is we're always learning something new and we have to yeah. keep learning. But the thing that I think is the common thread and even in the story that you just mentioned is there are lots of ways that humans are putting these threats on these animals, right? So mm -hmm. the salmon are likely eating the anchovies because we've done things like destroy the habitat of other types of forage fish that the salmon would have been eating if they had a choice to do so, Very right? True. So, so I think, you know, when we're removing invasive species from these islands, it isn't a, you know, a, a blank check for the land managers, the ocean managers, or the rest of society to do whatever we want with these places because now they're good, right? Like there are other threats that we have to make sure that we're mitigating against. Like we have to make sure that we're making sure that we're being sustainable with how we use the land and the ocean. And that's never going to change, right? And we have to make sure that we're thinking about all of those threats at, at the same time. This may be the biggest one in invasive species, but it doesn't mean that they're not going to be impacted by others too. Yeah, and it's it's so easy from a, a human standpoint to just say, um, oh, well, it's just this. I'm just doing this, you know, but that that has such a domino effect that, you know, 10 steps down the line, there's a, a huge effect over it. I was reading... I was I was reading a um article about fishing in the in the Great Lakes and they're having some political issues right there now because a lot of people want to fish, some people don't want people to fish, and the people that are fishing, they're fishing and and getting bass. And a lot of times they'll just catch the bass and toss them back in and think no big deal. But what's been happening is that um the goby fish, the round goby is eating all the hatchlings of the bass so the bass as soon as they swim away for just five seconds these round gobies are just ready to start eat, eating their hatchlings so that that you know two three minutes when you remove that bass um it, if that bass goes back down and starts and is looking for its hatchlings they're gone because of the round goby swooping in there and you don't think oh you think oh i'm just fishing i just it's five seconds and you feel good about yourself i'm throwing them back in look i'm doing good i'm not taking them <laughs> home with me but <laughs> you're you're killing off that whole species so it's yeah. it's 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 yeah. kind of funny how that uh how that works because the bass too they they had said that bass are very susceptible to eating anything while it's guarding its hatchlings mm -hmm. so at the second that that hook goes within its sights boom it's biting it and it'll probably you you toss that fish back in it'll probably bite it a second time about five minutes later you know but yep. it's just it's crazy how um when you really really research how how so in depth and specific um you can make a, a huge impact both positively and and, and negatively mm -hmm. it really is so yeah. eye-opening yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when it comes to what we think about on islands, simple things like I'm going to go on vacation and I'm going to visit this new place. I'm going to go to the Galapagos. Check your shoes. Have you washed your shoes? Yeah. Are you bringing anything you shouldn't be bringing? Right. Like there are <laughs> reasons that we have biosecurity because that one little thing, that one little trip or that one little, oh, I'm just going to do this could have a lot of impacts over time. Right. So um, so yeah, it, it is so complicated, but you know, little things we can do every day to help, um, the effort is, is going to go a really long way. Yeah, it, it, it does. And I think, um, I, I have to say, I'm a huge fan of your job, by the way, I'm a huge fan. I mean, so you're... I. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> going to different islands. And, and so I, I have to ask you a, a quick little question. Um, I hope I'm catching you off guard too on it. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> What's you've been to probably how many islands, you know, in, in the world, what do you have a favorite one? If there's one that sticks out in, in particular, you know, is there one that like just the, the views or the wildlife, you just connected with that Island, um, better than others. Do you have a favorite? Boy, that's really hard. It almost feels like picking from your children. <laughs> you um... go top three. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, I guess I have not personally been able to visit nearly as many islands as I would like to, right? Like um, in, in my job, luckily, most of what I get to do is help the rest of our team go to these amazing places and I get to support them. But I have had some personal experiences that really have uh, stuck with me over time. And um, I guess I'll, I'll do, how about this? I'll do the freshest one, um, which is this last year I had the opportunity to go to Palau, which I mentioned uh, before. And it was this island in, um, it's called in Narhalong State. And we're working with our partners there, the Ibil Society. And what they do is they focus on doing education with youth, both cultural and environmental, mm -hmm. and they're restoring this island that they have guardianship over. So we were working on restoring that island with them. And, um, and it was amazing because not only do you get to see the effects of all the changes, right? The native trees growing back, they're helping to raise sea cucumbers and they're um they're learning about their culture from their elders in these places and there's the story that really stuck with me and made me think about the island ocean connection challenge where there's this bird you know about i don't know what is it like maybe five or six inches tall and it can't fly it's called the megapode it can't really fly very well it's more like a land bird and they create these giant nests like 15 feet across 10 feet high sort of thing over oh, time it's a, it's a one bedroom then it's a exactly. one bedroom condo <laughs> <laughs> yes. and um and they create these nests and uh biologically they have over time done this next to their partners the sea turtles and they've developed this relationship together and so there's this oh, wow. uh, native Palawan story that talks about the brother and the sister, the sea turtle and the megapode. And the sea turtles lay their eggs at the base of the nest of the megapode. And the megapode kind of looks after their, their hatchlings, right? Oh, wow. And as the hatchlings run that gauntlet to get out to the sea, the megapode is like watching over them and putting leaves out in the water so that the hatchlings could swim in the shallow water without being seen by predators, things like that, right? Like amazing yeah. stories that these are things that have been taught for generations there. And to see these animals firsthand and to hear the stories and how they celebrate these species together and how we're helping them restore these things, it was amazing. That is, that is, it's so human. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That is so nice to see and hear. And it's always it's always nice to hear like just amazing stories like that and how things how things work and adapt and and move on with each other like that. Yeah, absolutely. It was really inspiring to see these high schoolers, you know, working sweat on their brow and enjoying it as much as they were. It was it was very it was very cool to be there. Yeah, that, that brings a, a, a quick topic to my mind, too. What um. I mean, have you guys ever considered like as an organization to kind of like get into like the school systems or in colleges or in high school to kind of like um, bring this into more of like a, as like a basic common knowledge type of subject like we do with science, math and history to where, you know, you're kind of teaching teaching kids like not like necessarily how to behave in the wild, but just like of them being aware of really how deep biodiversity is and how much effect you can have just by walking into the woods by talking loudly um have you guys ever thought about that because i think that would be really unique and i think there is a high demand for it right now too that people would people would love to take your class like if they're like oh penny's teaching uh <laughs> you know <laughs> island conservation 101 9 a.m on thursdays i'm there <laughs> Uh, well, I love that idea of certainly a lot of young people learning this stuff as soon as they can, right? Um, every once in a while, we we get to have an opportunity to talk to kids and, and to have these discussions with them, and it's really uplifting. Thankfully, there's lots of organizations around the world that are really focusing on, yeah, we've got things like science, like technology, and engineering, and math being more of a focus, but you know, what about the environmental piece? What about understanding your natural world and respecting it? And, you know, I think one of the most important things we can do for our kids is, yeah, they should hear about it in the classroom, but that's not where you it is, really yeah. learn to respect it. It's 
going there Mm -hmm. and being a part of it, right? I grew up in Oregon and we had outdoor school where an entire week of fifth grade, we spent it outside and learning about the natural world. I hope all states in the U.S. are doing this and all around the world that kids are having the opportunity to to do something like that, because I think that is really where you can learn those lessons the most and they really stick with you. Yeah, it's definitely a a hands on. um, It would be a hands on subject for sure. (laughs) Not one you'd be wearing a shirt and tie into. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thanks. um, Thanks for chatting with us, uh, Penny. I really, really. uh, appreciate it if if i could speak for any of the creatures that you guys help preserve i could say just thank you on their behalf because if they would talk i'm sure they would be stark supporters of you guys (laughs) thank you so much thank you so much and i think you know island conservation is a small nonprofit, and we really only exist because we've been lucky enough to have this ecosystem of supporters that we do and and donors and you know, so yeah, where, thank you to them for yeah, sure. Where can people find you guys? Like, is it um on Instagram, Twitter, website? How can people either help? Is it through donating? Is it through can people you know kind of get involved or? Yeah, absolutely. You can certainly find more information on us at islandconservation.org. Um, one of the best ways to keep in touch with us and to hear stories about what we're doing and to hear a lot of the the cool things that our staff are going to be sharing is to sign up for our newsletter. So that's um, directly there. Of course, we're on social media too, and you can catch up with us on on Twitter or on Instagram or Facebook. And yeah, absolutely. We're always looking for supporters. We're looking for more people to tell the story and um, hoping that it resonates with more people over time and, and that we can get additional support to do more of the good work. No, I I love your story. You guys deserve a Netflix special on this because it could be so beautiful. You can have every (laughs) island portrayed perfectly. 465,000 islands on on Earth. And that's just, that's so eye-opening to to know how large our world is. Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of work to do, but it's um, it's got a lot of hope in it for sure. Yeah, it does. It does. And I I can't wait to um, catch up sometime down the road and see what what new projects you guys have been working on and and what other species you guys have, have helped. So I'm super excited for that. And hopefully we can um, make that work. Absolutely. We've got some great projects that are in the pipeline for this year. So look forward to keeping in touch. All right. Well, that sounds great, Penny. Thank you so, so much. And I'm sure I will see you down the road. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Daniel.